Great to be with you today. Lots happening in these 30 minutes. I'm going to give you very substantial teaching on today's topic that you see behind me here. And then I'm going to show you what I shared with the pastors in the Islamic nation of Pakistan, a message to rally them. And then the best will be at the very end of our program, uh, 112 seconds of complete glory from Indonesia. So uh, you don't want to miss any part of this. And remember, the phone numbers are there for you to get in touch with us. But right now, let's get to the teaching. Unmet expectations causes offense. They expected Jesus to be different, that he would behave different. You, you know, I've, I've seen that. Uh, people uh, hear about something or someone, and then the person is not exactly what they thought they would be. And so they become offended, and they say, oh, this is not what I expected. I, I, from time to time, you know, I'm so glad I was meditating on our church family here that... Uh, you know, pretty well all the teachings I do here is not messages of correction, because frankly, we're not a church, I think, with a lot of problems. You're pretty good people. You're pretty good people in this church. We've got pretty good people. I mean, we don't have perfect people, but I don't find myself, I don't pick this subject because suddenly I hear about people being offended because I'm not hearing that. I'm preaching and teaching preventative medicine. But then I was meditating on it, and I heard somebody had been offended at something in our church. So it was the only thing I could come up with of all the church, the only offense. And the offense was at the people sitting in the sound room over there. Uh, now, now they're lifting their heads all of a sudden. Somebody had, was offended that they ate a sandwich during the service. No, no, it's true. It was an offense I heard about quite recently. Because the person said, well, in the church I was raised, you couldn't eat a sandwich. But I was thinking of the poor people in the sound booth. What if they got hungry? <laughs> see, see, everybody's looking back over there now. But, but they were offended at that. And they maybe came from a background with a very sacramental view that buildings are holy. And as such, we should not put a half-eaten sandwich in front of us. We, we understand that's a sacramental view. So if you come here with that view, you will probably be offended because we don't see buildings as holy. We see people as holy. We see people as being temples of the Holy Spirit. But if you have a mindset that we should be in this awe and we should walk into this building and suddenly start to whisper, and, and be acting like these walls are holy, that they're infused with some spiritual energy that other similar walls are not infused with, you will probably be offended. Because what you expected is not what you got. But we learn here that though Jesus was there, Jesus was releasing his presence Jesus, who had been healing everybody in Capernaum, he was now in Nazareth, but he couldn't do any mighty works because of offense, meaning the power was flowing, the anointing was there, but they couldn't plug into it. Another way that the Bible talks about this, let me read from Mark 4. It says, The ones sown on stony ground, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they become offended. So, <laughs> we have all had opportunities to be offended. So, whether we let that offense take root or not is connected with how we have handled the revelation of Jesus Christ. If we just got caught up in a feeling, an emotion, a, a music, and it was good vibes all around, chances are as soon as anything comes that is not to your liking, you will be offended. And, and, and so when we talk about being rooted, let me just add to that scripture, Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you're being rooted and grounded in love. And so when we are not rooted in that, we're not grounded in it, 
We are easily swept in up and the slightest thing can offend us and we walk away. But Paul says, I myself, I always strive to have a conscience free from offense towards God and people. Maybe the classic example is the one we found in the, in the book of 2 Kings in Naaman. I'm going to read it to you, Naaman, uh, 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 9. Naaman stood at the door of Elisha's house, and Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Here you have a man who is just, you could say here in the Old Testament way of describing it, he is next door to his breakthrough. He, he's right there. He's next door to his miracle. He's ne next door to, you know, going ahead, getting his promotion, getting his blessing. Call it whatever you want, but he misses out on it. He got almost blessed, almost healed, but he was offended. I can see Elisha sitting there, and probably he kind of knew there's a bit of a puffed-up individual about to arrive at my door, and he, is spe he wants special treatment. See, some people feel that they need to have special treatment because of their success in society or because of their status. I meet this all the time. In fact, I'm approached... For example, I was approached that way in the last few weeks. People approached me wanting me to deal with them differently because of their status. They might be a chief of police. They may be a general in the army. In fact, I had all those kind of people do that. So they expect something different. Like I am special. I, I, I can't receive just like little mama from the slums here. <laughs> I can't receive like little mama living on the, on the wrong side of the railroad tracks. Uh, you know, it, 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 it needs to be a proper healing prayer. <laughs> it, needs to be, it needs to be a proper <laughs> miracle ministry because I'm here. And so I kind of, you know, if you let me use my sanctify imagination, I kind of can imagine Elisha sitting there. He said, okay, I, I know the guy that's coming. So he hears the door knocking. He's probably eating pizza. Can you see Elijah having a pizza? Uh, maybe, maybe, you know, he, he's enjoying himself. And, uh, and the messenger runs to the door. And he says, oh, it's the great general. Oh, Elijah says, just tell him to go and dip in the river down there. It's kind of dirty water right this year, time of the year, but just have him dip seven times, and seven times he come up, everything's going to be good. Hallelujah. <laughs> and he keeps eating his pizza, pepperoni, you know. <laughs> Don't get hungry now. Okay? And, and, and Naaman, you know the story. He, he's furious. He's offended. How could I be treated like this? H how could I be treated this way? I mean, it's me, Naaman. I I'm hot stuff. I mean, he should be honored that I'm coming to his door. I mean, I'm just not some woman, some widow from Seraphat here, or some little, per little person like that. I'm the mighty Naaman. This is really, we could do a selfie if he wants to, but, but I, I want my due. So he, he is offended. Isn't that interesting? And he walks away in a, in a a huff and a puff. I says, I'm not going to do that. At the, at the very least, I expected him to lay his hand on me, kind of a minister of laying of hands very smoothly, and, and, and kind of I imagine that somehow slowly as his hand moved, the leprosy would kind of vanish and new flesh would come. I, so he had it all figured out. People say, well, I don't think the preacher took enough time listening to my prayer request. Some of the, some of the, some people, you know, they, they want to tell their prayer request in such detail that even if you had faith when you met them, you almost lose your faith just, just listening to it all, and, and it would be better. If, if you didn't know, you could pray, you could pray just more in blissful ignorance of all the aches and pains and whatever doctor said in Toronto and, and Winnipeg and Vancouver and Montreal and every specialist they were sent to and, and Texas and wherever they went. It, it, it would be easier to, but, but they, they feel like, well, I'm special. 
so that he's offended. He's offended. And he's about to lose. The blessing is the same idea as the people in Nazareth. And Paul says, I strive always to have a conscience that's free from offense towards God and people. I'm so marveling at the way Paul is saying that because he doesn't ex express any other area that way. I was thinking, have you felt like being offended lately? H have you had an opportunity to feel like somebody slighted you? You deserve better. You, you know, it's like, and you get caught in that trap and you carry that offense. It's like, you know, when you want to catch a monkey. I never caught a monkey, but I hear when you catch a monkey, you have, a, you have a, like a little cage and you have a little hole big enough for the monkey to stick its hand through, but then you have a banana on the inside and once the monkey grabs the banana, they can't pull out again. And they won't let go. They just, they could easily get, get free. They just have to let go of the banana, <laughs> and then you just pull back out again. But, but once they got that banana, they, they're just holding on. That's how an offense works. You say, well, I want to be free, but I'm holding on to my banana offense. I, I, I want to hold it. I want to look at it. I want to coddle it. I want to nurture it. No, what the, what the admonition from the Spirit is, let go. You, you see, offense, it's like causes you to avoid people. And, and, and you're really bothered by positive news about other people. And as I said, if you hear bad news or negative mentions, you feel inwardly, yeah, they had it coming. And, 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 and it's almost obsessive. You got to talk about this. You got you to constantly hold on to that banana. You can't let it go. You got to hold on to it. You can even get so you secretly wish for ill for somebody else. And I say again, we are living today in the golden age of being offended. You are praised in the media. If you hold on your offense, just hold on tight to your banana and be hooked to that banana for the rest of your life. Have your hand in the cage. You'll never go free. But I say, no way, Jose. I recognize it's a trap. It's a trap. It's a trap. I also recognize, number two, that Jesus died for my offenses. Romans 4.25, he was delivered for my uh, offenses. And then I strive. I say like Paul, if the mighty Paul the apostle had to be on guard against this, I strive to have a conscience free from offense towards God and people. Conscience. Con what your consciousness you know, we talked about it, discipleship. What is it, discipleship? People say, we need discipleship. And what they often mean by that is that you get someone to receive Christ and then bring them to meetings to tell them what they must do. That's discipleship. Give them the do's and don'ts. And then if we can just tell them so that they can become just like our denomination. They become just like us. So if you're a Baptist, you want them to be the Baptist way, Pentecostal, non-denominational. You know, that's, that's what we call discipleship. But I was introducing the concept that discipleship is to help people live in consciousness of Christ. That's true discipleship. Because if they have a consciousness of Christ, they will do those right things they will do those things that are good, but that's discipleship. Rather than saying, we've got to tell them this, you've got to do this, you've got to read so much in the Bible every day, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. And the things that if they had consciousness of Christ, they would do on their own without being told you must, and this causes the joy to be lost. So, so to make disciples, you see, let me tell you something about denominations. Do you know that this goes back to the Jewish religion. From time to time in the Jewish religion, they had kind of revivals going. And certain truths became part of the, uh, that was preached in those revivals. So you had one particular revival about 200 years before Christ where they really emphasized fasting. Fasting. You know, people were, fell in love with God and they worshiped God and they said, and they made that institutionalized. You have to fast. And then they had special tithing and all. And that, that group we called the, 
what was called the denomination of the Pharisees. They were wonderful people. But 200 years later, they're still going through the motions of what they did out of love for God, and now they're doing it by dictates. So when we look at the Pharisees and say, oh, those were bad dudes. Well, why do, why do we think they were bad? Because we see them through the eyes of Jesus, and we see that all they're doing is going through an outward motion but the life that caused them to want to fast or want to give or whatever they were doing, which they now have institutionalized, that life is gone. And so when we are discipling people, and I'm doing a little bit of that right now, and we need to be discipled. We all believe in discipleship. It's not about, you know, come to church, raise your hand, you know, do this, say hallelujah, say praise the Lord, do all this. No, it's about the inner life. Because the inner life will propel the outer life. But if we just have an outer life, an outer behavior, it will very soon become hypocritical and you're going through the motions. I am saying, let's make disciples of Jesus Christ, not disciples of certain behaviors and certain traditions, but disciples. Christ consciousness is the antidote to being offended. I trust that the Word is working on you. I promise you there will be a lot of variety in this program. We are switching gear now. And now I'm looking at the world. My coworker Nathan Thurber just concluded a visit to Pakistan. I recorded a message in preparation for our great campaign coming up in that Islamic country. And this message was shown to about 1,200 and uh, 50 pastors and leaders. I thought I'd take it behind the scenes and show it to you. And then I have those 112 seconds of absolute beauty coming up at the end of the telecast. But right now, my message to the pastors in Pakistan. Greetings to you, my beloved pastors, leaders, and friends in Faisalabad, Pakistan. I have a prophetic word for you. Pakistan shall see Jesus. Faisalabad, Punjab shall see Jesus. I'm looking forward to see you face to face, eyeball to eyeball. And I give you this message. When the Apostle Paul was sitting before King Agrippa. He said that Jesus appeared to me. And he says, Jesus told me, I send you. That's what Jesus is saying to you in Faisalabad. He said, I send you to open their eyes so that they may see. This is God's word for Faisalabad. The problem is that many people do not see who Jesus Christ is. And who's going to help them see? Jesus said to Paul, you open their eyes. And that is why I'm coming to join with you in Faisalabad. We are going to open people's eyes so that they will see who Jesus is. And, 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 and then Paul says, when they, their eyes are open, they will turn from darkness. It means their eyes are darkened. They cannot see, but they will turn from darkness and they will see who Jesus Christ is. And, and Satan's power and lies are broken. And then they will receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance. Oh, you see, I have more than four decades of gospel ministry. We have ministered some of the largest campaigns ever conducted among Muslim friends. All across Indonesia, in northern Africa, Zanzibar, 
areas that just like Pakistan where most of the people are Muslim friends. They are not our enemies. They are our friends. We approach them in friendship, but we speak the uncompromising message of Jesus Christ, Isa al Masi. I said, Faisalabad shall see Jesus. How? Well, number one, we will make sure in that gospel campaign that they see Jesus Christ in the Word. We're not just preaching sentences and chapters. We are preaching Esau Masih, Jesus Christ revealed in Scripture. Then they will see Esau Masih. They will see Jesus in miracles. This has been our trademark for these many decades that dear friends, Muslim friends, Hindu friends, receive incredible miracles. Uh, it's going to happen in Faisalabad. And then they will see Jesus in new lives as people are transformed. I ask you to join me in this. I know some of you have been asking, well, who is going to host Dr. Peter Young? You are all going to host me. I don't work with just one church. When we go into a city, we work with everyone. Our Roman Catholic friends, Church of Pakistan, Baptist friends, Pentecostal friends, other groups, uh, independent churches. We want the whole body of Christ to come together. And then we'll reach out to the political leaders, a hand of friendship, just like Jesus and the Apostle Paul did. And so remember, for those days that I'm with you in Faisalabad, those evenings, they're not going to be just like another church meeting. Listen, pastors. You have church meetings every Sunday. When I come to be with you in Faisalabad, it's not for a church meeting in a stadium or in the open air. It's for a people meeting. We, we want to reach all the people. Christians are people. Hindus are people. Muslims are people. And Jesus loves people. The record is clear in the Holy Scriptures that Jesus healed people regardless of their religion. Yes, Faisalabad shall see Jesus Christ. And together, we're going to see to it that it happens. People say, well, well, the Holy Spirit will show us Jesus. Look here what it said in Acts chapter 26 and verse 18. Jesus says to Paul, you open their eyes and the Holy Spirit will help us. Let's join together. Let's serve one another. I come to you, dear beloved pastors and friends, to be your servant under Jesus Christ. And together, we will see eyes opened and people will say, now I see who Jesus Christ is. Thank you for joining me. In the name of Jesus, I speak faith and vision and power to every church to join in this massive task for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will see you soon face to face. There you have my behind the scenes message that is being shown to pastors and leaders in Pakistan. And, and I hope that gave you some food for thought, but then I promised you 112 seconds of absolute glory recorded just a few days ago 
in Indonesia. Watch. Thousands of you, I want you to come right here. I want to look you right in the eye. If you say, I want to receive forgiveness of sin, I want to acknowledge Jesus Christ. If you say, I say yes. Leave your place and come right now. Come on, thousands of you, come. Come right now. Say, God, I come to you. In the name of Jesus. I believe Jesus died for my sins. But God raised Jesus from the dead. Tapi Allah membangkitkannya dari kematian. And I confess now. Dan aku mengaku sekarang. Jesus is Lord. Yesus lah Tuhan. Jesus is my Lord. Yesus lah Tuhanku. Thank you, God. Terima kasih Allah. That my sins are forgiven. Bahwa dosaku diampuni. In Jesus' name. Di dalam nama Yesus. Amen. Amen. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins have been removed. That's what it's all about. Tens of thousands of people are receiving Christ. And right now we are in high season of harvest. I don't know any time in the history of our ministry when we have had hardly any breathing room. Just one campaign after the other uh, among people where there's so little witness of the gospel. I need your help today. This book, we will send it to you with a gift of any amount, or if you become a VIP partner, but I urge you, please take action. Don't let this come to a halt. Please go online and give or call right now. God bless you. Thank you. Your participation makes this global gospel ministry possible. To share your prayer request or to help bring the gospel to those who have never heard it, call 416-745-1820. You can give at www.peteryoungren.org or send your gift to World Impact Ministries at P.O. Box 62039 RPO Victoria Terrace, North York, Ontario, M4A2W1 or P.O. Box 433, Winchester, Kentucky, 40392-9800. Together, let's give everyone a chance to know God's love in Jesus Christ.